The following presentation was made possible by supporters like you. Consider making an impact today by honoring Science for Georgia with a gift or by joining our Catalyzer Network. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here. A little intimidated seeing all you fashionable people out here. And by the way, you're fine. As long as you don't throw it in the landfill, I'm OK with you. So welcome. I'm going to hold on to this instead of clipping it back on. So I am Tangeria Willis. And she told you a little bit about me. I am an electrical engineer. Um, and we'll talk about, I guess, how I got here. <laughs> However, I studied electrical engineering, and out of out of college, I I did uh, work for. I was actually a plant systems engineer for a nuclear facility for quite some time, and then I went on to do consulting, deregulating companies, and so I've always been a lover of fashion, but. I won't tell you my age, but anybody who knows, my mom was like, you are not doing fashion. There's no money in that, so find something else. And so I, I liked science and math, and so engineering was my thing. And I, I did enjoy it, but life just drew me back to the fashion world in ha happenstance, I'll say. Um, I am, I have a nine-year-old, I am married, uh, going on 13 years now. I'm the owner of, it, of e Closet, which is a designer upscale consignment boutique. I had that before I had Atlanta Sustainable Fashion Week, but I was always interested in how I was never a, a, a fast fashion kind of girl. And so I always wanted to find a way that I could do my part, and that started off being uh, e-closet and kind of morphed into Atlanta Sustainable Fashion Week, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Atlanta Sustainable Fashion Week is the first of its kind in, in Atlanta, and so I've been called uh, a change maker in that way. And most of the reason is because while everyone is talking the sustainability talk, there's this holistic view that people don't talk about. And one of those things um, evolves around the things that they say they want to protect. We want to save, you know, we want to do less gas emissions. We want to water overuse and water reductions, but we don't talk about textiles. And textiles are the thing that really causes all of those other things to happen. So if we can't deal with textiles, are we really dealing with the other issues? And so I, um, I tend to focus on textiles in that way to help people see that all of those things unite and they come together and they're all connected and we, have, we can't deal with one without dealing with the other two. So, so let's talk about, we won't talk about that. That's Sustainable Fashion Week. I guess I can tell you a little bit about that. So Atlanta Sustainable Fashion Week, I created in 2021 with the goal of really bridging the gap between consumers and sustainable brands because one of the challenges that I also see is that people, while people want to shop sustainably, they want to incorporate those brands and they don't know where to find them. They don't know how to find them. They don't know who they are. And because there's so much talk, the word sustainability now is much like organic was back in the day. Remember when organic came out and everyone was doing organic and nobody knew really what organic was? That's kind of the same thing with sustainability. And so it, I wanted to find a way to do three things, to educate people on really what sustainable textiles, what that means, what it is 
help you to decipher between brands that are greenwashing, if you know what greenwashing is, and, and really help you become aware of how to find those brands, how to incorporate them, and how you can do it with your current lifestyle, because I think that's the other problem. The other challenge is that people feel like it's, it's too expensive or incorporating it. I have to throw everything out that I once owned, and that's just not the case. So just teaching you how you can incorporate those things into your daily lives, excuse me, without blowing up your world as you know it. So fast fashion, the environmental impacts, which most people don't know, is it's, it's the second most polluting um, element to the landfills after oil. Textiles are the number two pollutant to the landfills. About 2.1 billion tons of carbon emissions each year, and that's about 4% of the world's total. So just take a moment and let all of that sink in, right? 87% end up in the landfill. So when we look at that, we're looking at you donate your clothes, you donate your clothes to a large donation space. I won't say any names. <laughs> you donate your clothes to a large donation space. And typically what happens, maybe about 15% of that goes into the selling pal where they put it in a store or they sell it to someone, the other 85% is either going to the landfill or incinerated. And that's what most people don't know. Part of the trouble and the problems with donations is making sure you know what is happening with those things that you're donating because a lot of times we don't know and we don't take the time to research because we're such a trusting people, right? We trust, we trust everybody. We like, we trust that you're gonna do what you said you're going to do. And we should, it just doesn't happen that way, unfortunately. So my goal is how do we try to remove that one garment at a time so that we're not ending up with this whole toxic landfills that are, are killing us and, and emitting all of these gas emissions and all of these things. So it takes about 200, 2,000 gallons of water, we'll talk about that, to make things like jeans, a pair of jeans. Who has on jeans today? <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? It, it's a lot, it's a lot. So, one pair, one pair, one t-shirt and one pair of jeans, you could drink water for 13 years on that one pair, that one t-shirt and that one pair of jeans. That's how much water it takes to manufacture that. But the other thing that is not on that slide that we don't really realize is that not only does it take that much water, we're not even talking about the chemicals that are, ex that are ex exposed in that water from the dyeing process that goes back into the water stream. And so there's that piece too. So not only do you have the water overuse, you have the water contamination from the chemicals that are being poured into the water as they're attempting to make your dark wash or your, you know, your acid wash or whatever those things are. So how did we get here? We got here because we don't have patience. We want everything now in as fast as we can get it. And we don't want to wait for it. We used to have patience. We used to be able to wait for the spring collection to come out and the fall collection to come out and what are the new trends. That happened twice a year. 
Now they're making micro collections 52 times a year, 52 weeks. Every week there's a micro collection. And we want to make sure, we want to make sure that we don't miss, we have a fear of FOMO, fear of missing out, right? We don't want to miss out. It might not be there next week. There's going to be a new collection, a new thing, that new shiny thing. The other thing that we've gotten accustomed to is social media is killing us because social media and mostly with, you know, our, our people that are avid social media people would know this. When you go out, you can't wear that outfit again. God forbid someone sees me in that same dress that I wore last year. And so we buy, we keep buying, we keep buying, and we keep buying. And the stores have decided, okay, we know they want to buy. How cheaply can we make this? And we'll make it cheaper. Matter of fact, we'll make the fabrics so that the fabrics won't even last. They're meant to discard after seven uses, right? So then I can sell it to you for $19.99. And I don't feel, you don't feel guilty because you're like, I only paid 20 bucks for it. It wasn't that much, right? So then we, we just discard it and throw it away because now we don't need it. But what we don't realize are things like the, the, plat, the, the materials that are, they're made of, the chemicals, those are all things that are harming our bodies every day. Some slowly, some, and you never realize it. It's like that little hidden thing that you never know, right? So we got here from overproduction. Currently, they produce about 80 billion garments each year. 80 billion. That's about 400% times more than they used to produce in a regular cycle. Just imagine that, 80 billion pieces of clothing each year. And if they don't sell, they just throw them away, right? So on average, we're only wearing an item five to seven times before we're either throwing them away, giving them away. And typically, because they're so cheaply made, it makes it easy for us to say, well, it's okay. But there's also, which I don't mention in any of these slides, there's a financial piece to this that we don't talk about. Because back 30 years ago when we were doing those two, those two cycles, the two seasons, spring, summer, we would budget for what we were going to spend on our clothing. And now, we still may have a budget. You may say your budget is $150, but when you pass by that thing that you just cannot give up for $5.99 because it is on sale, it's only $5.99. But calculate that if you do that 10 times in a month. Your budget is busted because you have your budget and you're not, you're not relating that to the budget that you're going to spend on those clothes. This is different. This is a different pocket. This was just on sale, so I'm just going to pick this thing up. And so, so not only are we it, mentally, we're, we're buying and we're buying and we're buying and we're buying things that we probably don't wear because half of the times we, we buy it, not because we love it, we buy it for all these other reasons. The last thing you bought, why'd you buy it? <laughs> last thing you bought, why did you buy it? Why did you buy the last thing that you bought? Do you remember? Yes. <laughs> I 
Well, that's good. That's a good thing. That is a good thing. I, I love it when you say, I can't remember, because that means that you're not out shopping every other week. <laughs> so, so that's a great thing. But a lot of times when we go, I have this motto that if I don't love it in the store, I'm not buying it. Because if I don't love it in the store, I'm not going to love it anymore when I get it home. Right? And I'm not going to love it anymore, which means I'm not going to really wear it. It's just going to hang on my in my closet. It was some real estate. I'm going to try it on. I'm like, yeah, I really don't think it really works for me. And then it'll just sit there until we throw it out. And so if you focus on things that you love, you tend not to buy as much, right? Because when you put on that one thing that's like, Oh my God, this makes me look so slimming. <laughs> this is the best thing ever, I feel so good. And it's an energy that exudes, and so that is what you want in your clothing, right? So, so basically we got there because we shop too much, we do too much, we, you know, we see our folks, we watch TV, we want the next thing that was on TV, and people have figured out how to market it to you. And that's what we have to stop. We have to start with being patient and understanding that we don't need those things and those things are harmful to us. Well, how are they harmful to us? Let's look. These are all bad chemicals that are in your clothes, right? And I'll go through, I have another slide, but flame retardants. We do that all the time. You, you wear something that's flame retardants. And what's crazy about that is that a lot of kids' clothes have that flame retardant chemical in them, right? And so flame retardants, it causes skin irritants, hormone disruptors, the, the pieces in yellow, because I'm sure you can't see that, the pieces in yellow indicate short-term um, effects. So these are things that can cause health impacts in the short in short term order. So they can happen fairly quickly. Whereas the things in the purple, after prolonged or extensive exposure, they can they can cause problems. But just take a look at that chlorimeach, azo dyes, and I'm gonna say I'm, I'm I have another slide which is gonna tell you exactly what that means which I um, don't want you to read because it's a lot of words. But, <laughs> but what it is is I want you to look at, just glance through it and see if you can see the most common word in all of that, which is cancer. And almost each one of those definitions can be cancerous causes cancer, been known to cause cancer, respiratory problems. How many people have asthma? How many people suffer with allergies all the time? We've never thought that it could be our clothing that's causing this, right? We've never given that that much thought. It's just clothes. But when they make those clothes and they process them so cheaply, they make them that fast because they make them with all of these chemicals that then, as the clothes start to biodegrade, they have to go somewhere. So they go into your body and they go into the environment. And it's really, really scary what it's doing. I've had at least four people that I've known in the last year diagnosed with some form of cancer who have never smoked, never been around any kind of, um, any kind of 
any kind of things that would cause, that were typically known as causing cancer. And you wonder why these things are happening. And so we have to stop and take a look at, at why and start to eliminate things individually and in changing how they are in our wardrobe. A lot of clothes they make are made from polyester. Does anybody know what polyesters are? It's plastic, absolutely. Yes. Do you know that every time you wash that, it, it also releases microplastics into the water stream. So it's not that we're just wearing it, now we're drinking it, right? And then as the chemicals that are in there release into, into the environment, they also release into our skin. And so then all these things are happening and we can't figure out why. It's not just the hurricanes, it's not just the tornadoes. It's all of these things combined together. And so that's why this is an important slide to me. And as you, as you can see, some of these are in everything that we do. Raincoats, shoes, mattress pads. Everything that has some sort of textile related to it is in there. So the five most toxic fabrics, polyester, of course, number one, right? Made from anything made from synthetic fibers you don't want. And then I'll also point out another thing too, when you're looking at because, because of greenwashing and because of marketing, one of the things that you have to start looking at your tags, things like vegan leather. Sometimes when you look at, depend on who's, who's making it, I won't name them, but depend on who's making it, you look at the tag, it's polyester. Right? So you have to make sure you understand what you're looking at. It's not enough to just see the big tag that says vegan leather on it. You have to look at the tag behind it underneath in the clothing and see actually what it's really made of. So we have polyester, rayon, acrylic, nylon, acetate. If you go home tonight and look at look at your tags in your clothing and, and figure out what percentage of that are those are those fabrics, then you kind of have an idea of how much that's affecting what you do every day, the environment, and how you how you're related. It's a lot to absorb, right? It, 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 you know, it's almost, you're almost left speechless because you look at clothing and you say, just about everything is polyester. Just about everything is made with these things. And it's not just the low to mid, the cheap end brands. There are some high end brands that are guilty as well. So don't just think because you paid a pretty penny and it's a designer brand that it's not made with some sort of chemical laden fabric. That could very well be the case. So what can we do? We can buy less toxic clothing, that's, <laughs> right, that's a given. Because the more conventional clothing you buy, the more chemicals you're, you're harboring in your home. So we can make sure that our clothing are non-toxic. Organic cottons, there's some you know, hemp, but you still have to know what you're buying and how the process. So 
Before all of that, one of the things that I say that you can do is read. I like to read. I love to read. Do we have readers in the house, right? Uh, you got scientists, you guys better be readers. So, <laughs> so, you know, one thing you can do is read. You don't know what you don't know, right? But you, if you read what's in the fat, read your tags, read what's, I was in the store. I won't tell you what store either. <laughs> I was in the store. This is food. And I was purchasing uh, my husband likes tartar sauce, right? So I was purchasing some tartar, tartar sauce. And I was looking at the different brands. And I just happened to pick up the store brand and turn it over and look at the ingredients. And one of the first ingredients it said was made with bioengineered products. Right? <laughs> Like, yeah, no. <laughs> but that's what we're putting on our bodies, too. So I, I think we try, because we like to say it's just clothing or fashion has always been made to, to be so superficial that we don't really think about it. But I, we have to. We really do have to. So... Buy Lex Toxic Clothing, buy used. So, and I get this question all the time and because I have a consignment shop and not all of the things are sustainable things, but one of the things that they say is you buy used, you don't buy new, That's that way you're giving it an extended life cycle, you're not going into the landfills, but also one of the benefits of buying used is because it has already been washed probably many times, most of the chemicals have been washed away that are in it, that were in it when it was originated. So it makes it healthier as well to buy used clothing because it's already been through the cycles. So that's another thing. Take care of your clothing. They last longer. If you take care of your clothing, of course, by quality clothing, it'll last longer. Wash it versus and hang it versus using the dryer. Dryer kills clothing all the time. So j just take care and make sure that you're 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 treating your clothing with love. Buy green eco-friendly fabrics, companies that don't use toxic dyes, companies that offer fair labor, fair working labor wages that usually have a process that's transparent. Companies should have processes that's transparent. Um, there is, which I did not put on this slide, there are a couple of websites and you guys can share it, or I can share it with you as well. But one is called Good On You, goodonyou.co. And the other is called remake.world. Those two websites, they have, uh, they rate brands. And they rate brands against their the quality they weight brands against the whether they are eco-friendly whether they use animal products or not the transparency in their manufacturing processes and they give you a rating on whether that product is considered green they're starting to make changes they're not making changes at all stay away and run <laughs> so, so those are two good sites that you could go to that you could look and begin to see, okay, if I want a pair of jeans, 
where can I buy a pair of jeans that are safer for the for the environment that are potentially using plant-based dyes that are using natural natural features to, that use recycled water to produce that's not overusing water those are all things that that would relate to what you're you know and make sure that you are purchasing the things that you want but in a healthier way, because there there is a thing out there for what it is that you wear every day that is a lot healthier, and I would I would implore you to do that. Non toxic detergents, fabric softeners, all of those uh, fabric softeners, all of those things have chemicals in them. They have chemicals in them, and so. Buy eco-friendly detergents. There are even stores um, now that where you can kind of put together and make your own detergents uh, as well that doesn't have those kind of dyes in it, toxic dyes. But even Costco has a brand of eco-friendly um, eco detergent and um, fabric softeners that are eco-friendly. There's also a company here locally, and the name of the company is TAP. And if anybody is familiar with TAP, they'll come to you and they'll refill. They'll, they'll, you can buy eco-friendly products from them, and they'll come and they'll refill them so that you're not throwing away plastic. So that you you just have their jar and you just they'll come and they'll refill it. They'll come to your house. You don't even have to leave the house, and they'll come and refill it. But the places like that that are offering solutions that I think are really really good. And then dry cleaning. Make sure that the dry cleaner is using non toxic chemicals as well, and they they should freely be able to tell you. If you dry clean at all, most people are not even dry cleaning anymore, but if you dry clean at all, make sure that it's a green dry cleaner, a dry cleaner that doesn't use toxic chemicals in, in their processes. So those are all ways that we can make a difference and that we can do something differently. Anybody have any questions? Sure. 2000, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so using 2,000 gallons of water you know, per jeans, mm -hmm. and that's using natural fabric, which is, you know, basically cotton. Yeah. But most of cotton. Mm -hmm. So as far as I know, they're basically four natural fabrics. You've got cotton, uh, wool, mm -hmm. uh, linen, mm -hmm. and silk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, they might be some more which is like, the most sustainable uses the least waste uh, and is best for the environment? So there's been, there's been a lot of controversy around cotton um, and more because of the water that it takes to produce cotton. And so that's been a real struggle while cotton is a natural fiber that there's been a lot of concern and they have been really trying to figure out how to correct that. One of the ways that, you know, if you use organic cotton is to find a location, like I said, that uses a recycling process. I personally, think wool is. I love wool. Wool is an amazing, amazing fabric and you can get it in all textures from really light. You can get it, that shirt could be wool. I mean, in any sort of uh, look and feel that you want from sweaters to just a, a men's dress shirt or it Wool is an amazing fabric, and so I would answer that and say wool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Um, I submitted a question online that I'm not going to ask. Uh, <laughs> why women never told us that uh, 
men could have stretchy jeans too. <laughs> but on, on a serious note, um, so a lot of uh, Georgia's second tier cities, uh, Macon, Columbus, Augusta, are on the geographic fall line. That's a drop in elevation that allowed them to be mill towns. Mm -hmm. But now, in a kind of a, a pattern that you're seeing nation or in all the developed world, where the blue collar ha were making their living, now is where the white collar are making their lifestyle. All those mills are closed, and now they're loft apartments and pool yeah. and things like Pont City Market. So my question is, has the horse left the barn? Is, is there a way to renew local production of fabrics, which may solve some of these problems? Yeah, so great question. And that's been one of the things that there's been talks about and we've been working on. There are a couple of small local manufacturers that are starting to appear. And um, people are, there are companies now that are looking at doing more manufacturing locally and in Georgia. So I think in the, probably within the next five to 10 years or so, you'll start to see more because that's part of the initiatives to, uh, to create a better climate, not only you know, for Georgia, but you have to have some local manufacturing because you can't, the transparent process is really difficult when you cannot go and see what's happening and be able to audit that system. So the short answer is yes, it, it, it's a slow moving wheel, but it is slowly happening. Do you have to press it? Oh, it works. Okay. <laughs> press this button. Okay, so you have a slide with all these toxins and sure. clothing. Sure. Let's go and back. Like flame retardants. Mm -hmm. I expect my clothes to incinerate on contact with fire. Why is that in there? Can you talk anything about why it's cheaper to expose our clothes to all these toxins? Why are they in here? So. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because you said I expect my clothes to. <laughs> yeah, I expect them to burn. Just, just burst into flames. Like, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, the reason is, is becomes, it, it's really because the more we have with the more we want. I mean, that's, that's the short answer. And we want something differently. I want to run five miles, and I need it to be dry fit, and I need it to be, you know, all of these things. And so we start making those demands. Whereas 50 years ago, our mothers, our fathers, they did all of those. They worked the farms. They did everything that they did, and they didn't worry about anything being flame retardant or all these extra chemicals that were that were included in our clothes at all, right? And so so now it's it's really up to us to say we don't want that. We don't want these things to be we want to live now. We want we want our clothes to burst into frying flames, right? So <laughs> you know, we just we want the natural fibers. We don't need all of that extra stuff. It becomes a a almost a point of greed like we just want to have things that we don't even use things that we don't even know we have but we want it anyway just to say we have it and so there's no real reason why they need to be in there they really don't it's just a, it's just been for every everything that comes out someone has to try to make it one step better and that one step better in their minds included a chemical that can make it do something else and that's the problem that we have currently did i answer your question yes partially i just kind of wonder why it's not a, it looks like it's more Yeah, so because yes and no, yes and no, 
Um, because a lot of times, I mean, some of these things, if you, if you go back, some of these can be considered natural chemicals, things that grow, or, but it depends on how we're using it. If, it's, if the way that it is processed is, is causing harm, that's the thing that they're putting in there to make it happen. So like for instance, um, like lead and chromium. So it's found in rocks and plants and all of those things, right? But if we manufacture it in a, in a process that it becomes in high concentration, some sort of, that we're saying we're protecting a chemical over all of these natural products, then it becomes harmful. So it's not that it's necessarily more expensive to do, it's just how we're processing it and using it to coat our clothing to achieve whatever that goal is at the time. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Um, I just had a question about. It, it seems like there's a lot of goal, um, a lot of goal in this industry, like especially from a waste perspective. There's water. You mentioned landfills. Um, you know, and I think just even the environmental uh, impact and the impact to our health and such. Mm -hmm. like, is there anything from an industry perspective? Like, are, is there a body that's kind of focused on this, or um, any or is there any one of those goals that you would say is like most important to address sooner rather than later? And then the, and then the extra piece on that too is, um, you know, the various uh, governmental bodies that we have that of course are concerned with, you know, whether it's climate change or, you know, sustainable uh, things as well as, um, you know, EPA and things like that. Are they focused on these things very well and, and should they be? Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it was nice being here tonight with you guys. Now, um, so to answer your question, is there, let's like, answer the first one. So, is there any one thing we should focus on? I think that answer is different depending on who you ask you know, and, and what their priority is and what their passion is. Mine is textile. I think if we solve the textile waste problem, we solve the other problems because they're all connected. So that's why I feel that it's textiles because textile manufacturing affects the water overuse, the water chemical problems. It affects the gas emission problems. It, it, it affects the, the chemical warfare problems. All of that is cycled into textiles. And so my opinion, that's just my opinion, is that I feel if we, if we tackle that problem, then we can tackle the other pro the t other problems all start to um, lessen because of that. So to your other question, are there uh, the government uh, so uh, wow. So the government question that you asked, uh, I think that everyone, for the most part, the Paris Climate Agreement is the standard, okay? The, and, and the United Nations has uh, a climate control uh, that people are following as well. So between those two, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement those, that is what tends to be the gold standard that people are looking at to try to follow. The government is such a mess right now. It's just, it, you know, it's for, you have people over here that are attempting to tackle the problem and people over here that don't want to see the problem tackled. And so there's this push and pull for, you know, power and resistance and all of those things. So that answer I can't really give you, uh, you know, from about about that is, you know, I think we just got to, excuse my French, get our shit together. And 
and, and really decide to tackle it. Because for me, to me, it's, it can't be done in silos. Like all of those things that you asked about in initially, it has to be done together. We have to be all in one accord to try to solve and work on these problems. And so until we can do that, that's going it, to, it's going to take like a person over here and a person over here coming together and saying, we're going to do something because I'm not sure that the loopholes that you have to you jump through with the government right now with all of the discord will get you to there by the by 2030 or 2050 in the numbers that we're saying that we have now there are uh, some organizations that have been created to come together to try to solve this problem with the uh, fashion industry one is uh, the the Apparel Impact Association, and they deal with, and they worked with a lot, they work with the larger manufacturing um, and brands, fashion brands, to try to implement sustainable manufacturing processes and all of those things, and they have been really, really good in working hard at trying to do that from that end. So that's kind of the, the organization that has been kind of taking the lead and doing that now. I, I had a question. Sure. I, I like to sew. Okay. I put on buying fabric and it's new fabric and how do I find sustain, you know, used fabric. I go to like Scrap Lana. Mm -hmm. But is there a place to get like well-made fabric that's natural yeah. without having to buy it from overseas? So there are a couple of ways that you could do that. Some the designers that I work with, they they do a couple of things. They reuse old clothing, old fabrics, things like that. But buying dead stock, if they're at Scrapland or some of those other places, buying dead stock or last a reel or something like that, that's not being, that's getting ready to be thrown out, um, you can do that as well. And then there are, uh, there are some brands, and I can talk to you about that. There are some places that also have and kind of focus on more sustainable and natural fiber fabrics as well that you can use like hemp and tinsel and um, things like that. I've got a question. Yes. Um, so I have heard <laughs> Hi. great talk. That was very enlightening. Thank you. That, Thank you. I was wondering, I've heard that washing your clothes on cold, with cold water actually uh, helps it to release fewer microplastics. Is yeah. that something you agree with? I do, and also there's no real need to wash your, wash your clothes on any other cycle. I mean, honestly, it, they get just as clean. It doesn't matter that the water is too, you know, is hot in this cycle and hot. You can wash everything on cold and it will be just fine. And I think that's probably the best way to do it. And it makes your class, to me, it, it extends the life cycle of your clothes too. Thank you. That's funny because I feel like the washers are coming with more and more. They do. What yeah. Because we feel like we need, and then we look at it confused like, okay, do I need wrinkle free and steam? Like, you know, and you look at all these things when you, before you had hot, cold, right, warm, and that was it. Fast, slow, high, low, right? You don't need all that stuff. You know? I don't need a picture of me putting the clothes in the washing machine. I don't need to have an app where I pick it on my app to start it when I'm going down the street. I don't need a delay to set it when I leave the house. None of that. Hi. Hi. Part of that sustainability also, um, 
I not only design and build costumes, but I also quilt. And we recycle. I can't be recycled anymore. Yeah. Uh, sheets, in fact, a friend of mine brought me bags upon bags of fabric from about four generations. And I looked at it, and with the exception of one, it is all cotton, mm -hmm. for which I'm grateful. But buying sheets from Goodwill, Salvation Army, thrift shops, make great backs. It does. Quilts, and you don't have to buy new fabric. Yeah. And I'll tell you another thing. Old T-shirts. T-shirts, shirts, skirts, blouses. Yep. We use them all because you can cut them in any shape. You, you can. Have. And I, I will make, I will take an old T-shirt, cut out the neck, cut slits in, in the bottom, and make a tote bag. <laughs> and there will be a bag that I can just throw stuff in. And, you know, if you have a favorite T-shirt that you're like, oh, I, it's probably so worn, I need to throw it away, that's a way that you can reuse it. And then use the other pieces as cleaning cloths. Or th There's so many ways that you can get to zero waste um, and reuse and reuse and reuse your items. One other thing, you, when you were talking about the plain retirement, mm -hmm. the reason it really came about was if you remember back, I'm old enough to remember when the floor furnace and had that hot grate, and it was really to prevent toddlers and infants from going up in flames. Yes, and that's why they put them, um, that's why you see more cl children's clothing yeah, with flame that, retardant features. You will find the manufacturer cannot sell it unless it has flame retardant. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And even though our lifestyles have changed, they haven't changed the law. <laughs> no, and that's the part. Is some of the laws are so old and antiquated and not necessary, but, you know, a, a lot of times we don't know what they are, and so we're not going to fight that. And so that's one of the things that we have to do, It's and that's why it's a group effort. It's not something that one group can do over here in a silo. So I agree with you 100%. You're absolutely right. Uh, a couple of small points I thought of. Um, one, uh, with Joanne's Fabrics being the primary big box store one, mm -hmm. uh, suddenly started doing 10 years ago or so, I think it was, um, is they started importing a lot more from China and things like that. And it started, if you start reading some of the materials list on cotton fabric, it should just be cotton. Uh, but they also now sometimes have other indeterminate fibers. But they don't actually tell you what those term, undetermined fibers are, because it's whatever the manufacturer trying to decide, hey, this is. And it could be anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, another one in early 2010, there was a case in Australia where, again, a major retailer imported lots of uh, like, uh, sweatpants, sleeping sweatpants and jumpers for children. They end up having, I think, a dozen cases of spontaneous combustion because they had over three and a half times the limit for formaldehyde in those outfits. So you could be from here to, to you, if away from the space heater, and that would be close enough to spontaneously combust yeah. that formaldehyde. Um, and a third item was about sustainability and cost. I was having a discussion on Thursday with somebody at, at a political event, but the ones that say bring everything here for manufacturing. But in 2008, the Bangladesh Women's Garments Workers Union successfully lobbied to double their salary from six cents an hour American to 12 cents an hour. Mm -hmm. And then you have to compete, and they say, well, you should bring it all back here. Well, they're making 12 cents an hour, and that is good money for their particular area in Bangladesh, versus you're going to pay somebody $15 an hour here at least to do the same job. Yeah. And you're going to spend, you know, $29.95 to get a, a, a sheet set, possibly, or you're going to go and spend $200 to get a sheet set. Yeah, agreed. However, however, that's one of the 
one of the issues that we're fighting with sustainable fashion and sustainable textiles is the whole fair working, fair living wage for not only us here in the United States, but in places like Bangladesh. And, and so that's why places like the Apparel Institute are, are working with uh, the Apparel Impact um, Organization is working with those types of big box companies and brands to change how that manufacturing is done and to incorporate those things just for all of those reasons you just said. All right, we have one more time for one more question and you have the mic so you I win. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering um, what your opinion is on uh, bamboo fibers. Um, can they be produced? I like fibers? bamboo. Yeah, I, I think definitely bamboo is, is a fiber that is, that is is sustainable and that you would definitely be able to incorporate into whatever you're wearing. I like bamboo, yes. Just wanted to be validated yeah. by the current fiber. I confirm, I affirm you. Thank you. <laughs> I like ending on that question. Some positive affirmation for the day. Um, all right, so let's give a huge round of applause for our speaker. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. For more information on Science for Georgia's mission and our past work, visit our website at scienceforgeorgia.org.